Some people make films to provide answer, but the way I make films is more like uh, posting questions. Is this the only way? Why can't we do it like this? Hi, this is The Vice Podcast. I'm Rai Han Salam, and I'm joined today by Wang Kar Wai, the celebrated Hong Kong film director who has made most recently a martial arts epic entitled The Grandmaster. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Tell me about your first movie memories, the first movies you saw as a small child. You know, I was born in Shanghai. I, I, my family and I, uh, we came to Hong Kong when I was five. And actually, we don't have any relatives in, in Hong Kong. So basically, it's, it's mom and my, parent, my, my dad and me and then and, and, and my mom. And my, my dad works at night. So, and my mom is a, uh, like a big movie fan. I still remember the first day we, we came to Hong Kong. This, this town is like, uh, it's uh, so strange because uh, the sound is different, uh, it's a different ambience. And so, a um, few days later, my, my, my dad uh, brought us to look uh, around and to find the films to look at. It is a local film. I think it is a kind of, um, it's not supposed for kids. I think it's a, a, like a Hong Kong version of Dial M for murder. <laughs> and the title of the film is like the, the, the murder in a bathhouse, you know. So the first image of it, I still remember clearly. It's a black and white film. There's a woman, it's not naked, but like in those days, uh, you won't see naked women uh, on screens but it's in a way is in her underwear, so dying in uh, bathrooms. So that's the first image that I, I still remember strongly. That's amazing. Right. <laughs> and, and it seems that that image has lingered with you for some time. Yes, I, we, we, were, we were like living in an area which there's a lot of uh, like uh, cinemas showing. At that time, there's like local productions, Mandarin films, uh, European films. And uh, of course, like Hollywood pictures. And mom's like, uh, she's a big fan of uh, like uh, cowboy films. And so we spend like uh, every day, mostly like in cinema. So um, this Shanghainese community, did it feel like a community that those who had come from Shanghai during that period? Uh, was it close knit? Did people know one another and, and, and feel alienated from the larger Hong Kong culture? Or was it more individualistic? In, in fact, it, 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 it is the situations at that point. It's like the reason why like Hong Kong have um, Cantonese, which is a local dialects, a cinema, and also the Mandarin cinemas, like typical uh, Shaw's Brothers productions, because there's certain communities is basically from the north, and, and people actually from the north, they are com coming from different provinces, but for the local Cantonese uh, majorities, they would call them the Shanghainese group, all right? But so some, they just lumped them all together. Yes, yeah. and the reason why they have this like Mandarin uh, speaking uh, pictures is basically is for these communities because, and all the productions is not really about Hong Kong now. It's all made in studio. It's really about the past, what happened in Shanghai and what happened in the North. So those who had been displaced having this exactly. intense sense of nostalgia. I, it, it, it's very funny. It's um, w the place where we live at, uh, at that time, actually at the corner, there's a small like hotel. And in fact, it's for those like Russian communities. We call them the white Russians. The whole, actually the small hotel you can see is full of like, uh, um, Russian communities and so when you look at them and look at ourselves it's like well it's the same thing it's like you're far away from your hometown and it's like um, it's um, isolated in a way. Was there a way in which the style of those who were the new arrivals from the north uh, differed from that of the local Cantonese speaking Hong Kong community? Was there just a kind of visual difference? Was there something that you could read in terms of the way one dressed or carried oneself? Sure, because uh, before, the beginning of the Chinese cinema actually happened in Shanghai. So in the 30s, uh, Shanghai actually is called a Hollywood in, in China. 
So when you look at the Mandarin productions, they are actually more well made. And for the local Cantonese production, it's mainly Cantonese opera. So they, they were shot like in two weeks. And uh, so the, it's, the quality wise is very different and subject wise is very different too. I wonder, given that you had this community that was displaced and that was not a sense from the city that was the premier Chinese city, the city that was the most cosmopolitan, the most international, mm -hmm. and then they find themselves in a place that they might have once thought of as a backwater. Right. So, you know, I wonder if there was a resentment that came from that, that feeling of your status having changed. You know, kind of, uh, for example, being an artist, you know, who's coming in the 1950s from Shanghai, and then you find yourself in Hong Kong, and then suddenly you find all of these these things reversed, these power relations reversed. I mean, do you think there was a sense of that? There was an anger about that? The, in fact, it's not because like my parents, they never thought they are going to stay here for long. They thought it's going to be something like uh, a transit because one day they still want, uh, hopefully they will be back to Shanghai. So basically it's for like the first generations of like all these immigrants, in a way, they took Hong Kong as a as a point for transit. They are not going to stay here for long. And only in the 70s, you can see the second generation, they, they, they began to take this place as their home. And, and by then, when you look at all the cinemas, the, the difference between the local productions and the Mandarin productions become like merging together. It's not really about the past, it's really about now. And they are not shot in a studio. So they are shot on the streets. They, more, they cover more about the realities instead of what's in the past and a fantasy. So it's, it's, you can see at that point, that is the first so-called Hong Kong new wave. There, I often think that there's a way in which the culture of Hong Kong during this moment you're describing, the, the 70s and onward, um, is in a way the culture of the entire world, or rather the entire urban world now. Um, just this idea of you know, a place in which you, for example, in that early era had garment manufacture and garment assembly. And so you had this rich profusion of colors and styles, and the idea of the pastiche and sort of people dressing and putting themselves together in these you know, different original, highly original ways. And that, of course, is the way that you know, many people in the Western world, for example, live now, partly shaped by that experience. Um, and yet, in many of your films, you know, one theme that people often bring up to me about your films is just the beauty of the clothes and the textiles and the elegance of them. Uh, and I wonder how you felt about that. I mean, was that something you were keenly aware of? Were you very aware of style uh, when you were growing up and as you were first entering the world of cinema? Well, it's something that, well, it's um, uh, Shanghainese people actually are very formal, right? So people thought like films, uh, uh, some of my films, like In Mood for Love, wow, this woman, she just go out to buy something and she's fully dressed up. But this is the way the people behave in those days. And actually it is uh, something that... Um, but it was the Shanghainese, not yes, the natives. Very specific. And even like uh, in The Grand Master, when you look at these people, they are not actually uh, uh, the so-called fighter because they belong to a class like a Yip Man and also Gong Ara. They are kind of, because they are from a very rich family, and so they are sort of like an aristocrat at that time. So they have manners, they have a, a, like, um, they have ritual, so it's, it's very different. And that's, I think, if you want to portray that certain type or certain class of people, then that's something very essential. It's about manner. It's like when I, when I, do, I, I remember I shot uh, my film, My Bulgarian Nights, uh, starting from New York. And uh, at that time, I'm, I'm, I, I travel um, to do some research in these cities. When you can, you can look at it, it's like, well, New York actually is the biggest size of Hong Kong because you can see all these immigrant stories. In fact, like in the for Love, I, I remember I, I visit to this tenement museum. When I look at this tenement museum, I said, well, uh, I'm sure people can understand In Mood for Love here because it can apply it to like a Russian immigrants in the 30s in New York, in the same tenements, a story like this can happen as well. So 
When you made My Blueberry Nights, um, was it this, did you think of it as an effort to transpose the style that you had pioneered in Hong Kong, or was it an effort to try to find some different style that you know, kind of particularly applied to the American environment? It's really related to In the Mood for Love, because the, the original idea of In the Mood for Love is called the three story about food. So it's about eating. So and, and at the end, I, I make the, f the first chapters too long, so it becomes the film. In fact, there's another chapter which happened in modern time Hong Kong in a kind of a deli in the central. So um, by the time I came to New York, because I'm doing research for another film, and then I have a chance to, to, to um, uh, sit down with uh, Nora Jones, and so we, we talk about the idea to make a film. And I think of, a, of that story, I said, wow, uh, I try to see if the same story happened in New York in a different language, what would that be? Will it be the same or is it a different like, uh, experience, the ex different expressions? So I think this is the starting point I want to make that, uh, uh, my Blueberry Nights. Many of your films are interconnected, sometimes very explicitly and consciously, and some of them, like Chunking Express and Fallen Angels, seem to kind of spill over into each other in a way. And I wonder, does this reflect a desire to hold on to the characters, the idea that you're not done with the character, the idea that the character is still lingering in your mind and that you want to put them in other scenarios and what have you? What is the source of those interconnections? Well, it's, it's really sometimes you feel like, well, because in the process of, uh, of uh, um, creating a story, a film, there's so many different options. And sometimes you just want to see, well, like Chungking Express, it's, uh, it's about a city instead of like two pairs of people. It's the days and nights of Hong Kong. And when I'm shooting like a, 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 a uh, fallen Angels, I just want to try to see, well, if I'm shooting a film in almost the same location, but a different way to show it. Because I still remember I want to create a distance in Fallen Angels. We're shooting with extremely wide angle. No one will, will use this angle for close-up because your face will look like a banana. But the thing is, it's also you can create certain aesthetics with it because it gives you a sense like the people are actually very close, but visually they are very far away. It's, and we are shooting in this almost same location with Chunking Express, but it's a different film. I think that, that's something that I want to do at that point. So it's partly a, a kind of visual exploration yeah. uh, of these shared spaces. And so the fact that the characters will sometimes bleed from one film to the other, do you think of that as secondary or do you think no, of that? No, it's, it's really like you keep asking questions about yourself. Is this the only way you can do like this scene? Or is it the only way to tell the story? If you want to make a film about the space, is it the only way to show it this way? Why not this? Right. Where do the characters come from? I mean, how do you develop them? I mean, is there, um, is there some shared practice? Do they, are they pastiches? Are they combinations of people you've known in your own life? Uh, or do you think of them as relating to the kind of visual landscape and just the right face? It, it sometimes it's, um, or most of the time, because the normal process is, um, there's a script writer, they have, he's, he has a story, and then you, you have to cast someone to play the role. But normally, I have the actors in my mind already. I have that face in my mind already. I have a kind of imagination. I said, well, I like, um, what if Bridget Lin is in this part, uh, playing a woman wearing a wig, a wig is a drug dealer. She never been to a drug dealer. She's like the Greta Garbo of Hong Kong cinema. So what if we do something like that? And, and that's the beginning most of the time, you know? And then you might use that face again in some other environment uh, right. to kind of test what it might look like in some other way. Mm -hmm. 
So the, so the faces to some degree come first and wanting to put them in these different scenarios. I mean, it seems that you've worked with many of the same actors uh, in a number of different films. You mm -hmm. come back to them again and again. Um, and you know, is it because you kind of grow accustomed to a certain kind of face and you have a hunger and a desire to see that face in, in other places? I just want to, to play with the audience. It's like, well, you believe him to be this person, a writer, but in the next film, he's also very convincing as a Kung Fu master. There's so many possibilities in life. In your very early films, crudely, one could say that they had more of an action-oriented, violence-oriented bent. And then you had a series of films that were you know, very lush and beautiful, and some would say romantic. And now in The Grand Master, you return to violence. Um, and I wonder, you know, what is it that brought you back to some of those earlier themes and to, and to violence and the depiction of violence? I don't think uh, The Grandmaster is a violent film. It, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really about actions. Kung Fu is the, the, the form and the beauty of it instead of the violence of it. And um, you have to, to understand, like, uh, when we first started, we are considered as like a very like off, we are not the mainstream in Hong Kong, the way we make films, the topics we make. And at that time, it's like uh, the golden time of Hong Kong cinemas in the 90s. So, so actually you can easily finance, get your film financed. And we are always want to keep the spirit of independence. So, and uh, at that time, when you are trying to finance your films, you, you do it by pre-selling your pictures. And normally, you have to uh, follow certain genre. So uh, it's after A Better Tomorrow, the John Woo's film. So every, everywhere, they just need gangster films. So we are going to make a gangster film, but it actually, it's not very gangster. <laughs> so you had no interest in gangsters as such. No, it I'm, was just I'm the... fine. I, I, always, <laughs> I, I will always like the challenge, like, well, I give you a, a certain genre, but is it the best you can do? Or is this the only way you can do it? And, and kind of exploring the inner lives of the gangsters, or, or kind of uh, the visual depiction some of the gangsters. Some people make films to provide answer, but the way I make films is more like uh, posting questions. Is this the only way? Why can't we do it like this? Your films has, have been described as porous. You know, there's a way in which they're very strategic, they're very intricately patterned, and yet, uh, there's a great deal of silence mm -hmm. in them. And I mean, so, so is this what you have in mind, the idea that you want the film to be open to interpretation? You want people to revisit them, to rewatch them, and to kind of derive different conclusions when they see them the second or third or fourth time? I think um, an interesting film is something that you can, you can have an aftertaste. It's sometimes when you look at the film, you might not get it the first time, but somehow it lingers. And I like the ideas of, like, the film that we made have, a, have an aftertaste for the audience. Were there films from your youth that you recall that left you with that kind of aftertaste? Well, there's a lot, you know. It's like, um, it's, it's a long list. Do they blend? Do they bleed together for you, or do some of them kind of really stand out? I mean, I'm curious if you could think of one, perhaps, uh, that you know left a particularly deep imprint. I still remember we watch a film, um, a Japanese film. It's the condition of human, a human conditions. The, the actually the translation of the title. The film is like eight hours long. <laughs> it's about. The, the Japanese, I assume there was an intermission. Yes, it's no, no. It, it has. It was screened in those days. There's no like. We are still. We. I, I still remember. I'm a, uh, I was a college student, and uh, it was showing on the Christmas date. So it's a challenge. So the film has like intermission every two hours. Yeah. So we start at like in the, um, in the morning. So there's. This, the, actually, the cinema the, is f half full. And then later on, there's only like few people's left at the end. 
because it is a black and white film. It's about the Japanese soldiers at the end of the war, because when the government, uh, when the, the emperor announced that the surrender. Uh, uh, so, but they didn't get the message. They are still in the forest and the Man Manchuria border. So it's a very long story. It's somehow you don't, you, because it's so long, you don't get it, you know? And, but the thing is, after this film, you, you realize why a, someone would want to do a film for eight hours. And, and uh, is it necessary to do that? But afterwards, when you read the thing about it, it's like, when you look at a film like this, it's like, it's a book. Once you finish it, you close this, the last pages, and that's it, you know. It gives you a sense like it's a life story, you know. When you described Hong Kong as a kind of place of transit, and the idea of it just being a place that felt, in that sense, very impermanent, it struck me that you went to see this film on Christmas uh, that was a Japanese film that was eight hours long. And of course, uh, you know, there are plenty of people, uh, I should think, uh, in that part of the world who didn't necessarily have very fond feelings uh, about the Japanese or about the Japanese military. Um, so it sounds like a very cosmopolitan kind of world. A and I wonder, when you think about Hong Kong culture having taken this thicker shape in the 70s and 80s, uh, it, it, how has that changed since then? I mean, you talk about the 90s as this golden age. So you have this culture that you know people had come, the Shanghainese and what have you, forming this kind of distinctive common culture of people who are transient, in a way, who then find they're stuck with each other. Uh, but of course now, you know, you have Shanghai, you know, experiencing this great revival. You have these larger changes in the culture. So what do you see happening um, in Hong Kong culture and particularly, uh, particularly in cinema? In my film, 2046, is the reason we make this film is because um, before the handover, the Chinese government uh, promised Hong Kong 50 years and change. Everybody think, well, this is a great thing. But actually, I'm not that sure. It's like, oh well, it's, it's very hard to keep, like, uh, to preserve something while the rest of the world is changing. So, in fact, when you look at Hong Kong today, you feel that that, that, that promise actually could be a curse because the rest of the world even China's is keep changing, and 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 the spirit of Hong Kong is we're trying to preserve what we have before, and so now it's time for for like for us to see like exactly uh, is it a good thing or we should have to figure out how to cope with all these changes around us. For instance, like cinema now. Most of the filmmakers in Hong Kong, they work in, in, in China because of the market and also because of the co-productions, right? But at the same time, we also concern that we want to make films still um, remaining the spirits, of, upholding the spirit of Hong Kong cinemas. Just imagine Hong Kong cinemas is something that is it's not supported by the government. There's no like uh, 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 grants. You don't have subsidies. It's almost like a, a wild kid. You have to, to, to find your own market. You have to make films for different audience. And you have to, to be uh, um, uh, flexible. And at the same time, and you have to make the film with certain energies. This is your first film, I believe, that is primarily in Mandarin. Uh, and I wonder if um, how the imperatives, so you know, on the one hand, having this enormous, uh, increasingly lucrative Chinese market seems like a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. for any filmmaker in terms of finding financing uh, and what have you. Yet, uh, on the other hand, you, know, you had talked about how you have these moments, you have these moments in Hong Kong cinema in which there was an appetite for the gangster cinema and, and what have you. I wondered, you know, the balance of opportunity and constraint presented to you and to other Hong Kong filmmakers by the Chinese market, I mean, you know, any thoughts? We always that? work with, uh, within the constraints. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't see this as a problem, even though like when I, when I make this film and uh, the, the Grandmaster, it's uh, most up, uh, the, like half of the film was shot in the North with people speaking Mandarin, but 
to me is not a, it's not a issue because even in 2046 or or in in the mood for love people speak uh, Shanghainese and some people speak Cantonese it's it's very like normal to me mm -hmm. and I don't feel that and I don't have to and I don't want to do something like well I want to cope for the Chinese market and uh, it's it I, I believe a film like Grandmaster there's something very universal it's like the feelings between the daughter to the fathers uh, the man, the responsibilities in front of the family and the country. I think it's, it's something that can be understood in everywhere in the world. I was very intrigued by what you had said before about this idea of this desire to preserve Hong Kong as it is, or as it was rather, um, particularly given that, you know, this culture, perhaps you could say it existed for a period of about 30 years, you know, going from this transience to forming a real culture around it, a real shared culture around mm -hmm. that. And yet you have, you know, think about, you know, right across the border in Shenzhen, the experience of displacement that those Shanghainese had in Hong Kong. I mean, that's the universal experience of that place. Right. And that's the experience of, you know, you could say all of urban China and you could say much of the Western world as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I wonder if that means that that kind of, that characteristic style might actually find a bigger audience, you know, kind of that, that arose in Hong Kong in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, if you think that that visual language, you know, might be more relevant uh, than ever before because that experience of transience uh, is so much more common. Have you seen The, the Grandmaster? I have. There's a scene uh, between the old Grandmaster and Yip Man. They're doing a challenge, a demonstration with the cookies. And I think that scenes tell you exactly what I feel about it. It's, you have to think beyond limitations. If the Hong Kong cinema is that good, so why this boundary, right? You can go anywhere. So what are the questions that you want answered or, or that you want to raise next? And when you think about the projects you're likely to pursue, uh, after the Grandmaster, you know, what are the, what are the things, I mean, is it, um, do you want to go back in time again? Do you want to kind of stay in the past? Do you kind of uh, intend to make, do you ever intend to make a contemporary film set in the mainland? One thing, that I think the privilege of being a filmmaker and what keep me working in this business is you can travel. You can travel in time, you can travel in different places, you can be someone else. And today you can go into the world of Chinese martial arts or you can be a drug dealer in Central. And what will be next? I don't know, because there's so many different options. And the way, um, in a way, I, I, I'm thinking, because I haven't made any films about contemporary Hong Kong for a long time. Because I think we have said what we want to say um, in the film from Chungking Express and Happy Together, until Happy Together. And I'm waiting, I want to see Hong Kong again in my films with a different perspective. Because I'm waiting for this city to grow into a different direction Well, we, we can find different space to tell different stories. Happy Together um, is about migrants. Uh, and you know, I wonder if that's a set of questions you're interested in pursuing in the future as well. Uh, just the world of people who are uh, displaced, uh, not only within China, but also elsewhere in the world. And My Blueberry Nights, I suppose, is also a story about people who have been displaced. Uh, is that something that continues to interest you? The reason I want to make uh, like a Happy Together is right before um, the handover. <clears throat> and what intrigued me about the idea of that film is um, we tried to make a film because everybody's at that time, once you start a project, they would say, well, is it about Hong Kong handover? Uh, what is it about Hong Kong before the, uh, 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 going back to, to China? So I just want to make a film as far away from Hong Kong as possible because I, I, I get tired with these questions because it's always the questions about this. And so, and I want to explore to see, well, if I'm going to the other side of the world to make a, a film about two Hong Kong people over there, what would that be, right? 
but at the end, it's still related to Hong Kong. Who do you think of as your contemporaries? Who do you think of as your peers uh, you know, among film directors, whether in Hong Kong or around the world? There's a lot. Tarantino is the peers, right? We are the same generations. In fact, it's, it's not about age, it's, it's about uh, the spirit. So you can say, well, you, you are actually in the line of this school or in the line of that school. Some people make films in a very, it's almost like a scientist. The structure is very clear, it's very rational. And some people are actually more like a, in, in, uh, uh, emotional or it's more like by feelings. Do you see yourself as being in dialogue with other filmmakers? Or do you see yourself as just really realizing your own aesthetic project over time? I think filmmakers, in, in a way, is like dinosaurs, you know. They have their own space and they're trying to, to do as much in... Because it, there's, you're busy with the ideas, you know. And sometimes when you look at works from other filmmakers, you... It's not that the inspirations, but the urge because you feel when you when, whenever you look at a, a very good film, you said, "Well, it's something that it's uh, really um, give you uh, reasons to make films and to make you feel like, well, you are not lonely." Or sometimes when you look at a very bad film, you said, "Well, maybe there's some, there's time I can when I if I'm going to make this film, I would want to make it this way." To Americanize your films from the 1990s, uh, the, the colors seemed quite amazing and very rich. And I wonder if there was something about the film stock that you were, they were using during that period of time that was different from the film stock being no, used in the United States. No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think it's when you... Have you ever been to Hong Kong? I have. That's the color of the city. It's very vibrant. It's very colorful. How about digital video and what have you? I mean, sort of the, the changing technology surrounding filmmaking. How has that shaped your palette uh, and the kind of tools that you use? I still remember I, I, some people call me, you are the, I think that's the, um, uh, one of the, um, a digital company. Uh, um, they, they once they offer me like, well, we want to do a project with you because we consider you as the last analog director. We want to turn you digital. But uh, so far, I'm still shooting with film style. Maybe Grandmaster would be the last one because actually at the end of the shoot, the Fuji uh, colors sent me a letter said, well, sorry, sir. Um, this film stock is going to be the last shipment because we're not going to produce anymore. So that means you have to go into the digital time and not going to shoot with film stock anymore. That, did, that sounds traumatic, potentially. I mean, yeah, how yeah, did you I'll feel upon getting the letter? Well, it's, it's, it's a sign for you to say, well, um, it's time maybe you should stop shooting the film because um, it's uh, the film, you're running out of film stock. And also it's a signal for me, it's like, it's the time is to a new era. Because when, whenever you look at, I still keep that can of uh, negative with me. And because when I look at this letter, I'm, I'm not only thinking about the film stock, I'm thinking about what happened to all, to all these beautiful Panavision cameras what happened to um, the experience of watching all these film grains, beautiful film grains on the big screens. So it will be a different experience. But So you have to, to, to move on. Yeah, it's fascinating because <laughs> you know, your name is associated with nostalgia uh, more than almost you know, any, any other term. And, you and yet it sounds like you're very unsentimental about uh, But if you are giving me... That giving me a reason to do something not nostalgia, right? So is that something that you might revisit uh, in terms of the questions that you're seeking to spark and to, seeking to raise with your future films? Do you see yourself going back to the future, going back to science fiction, perhaps? No, I just don't want to stay in a place too long. I, I prefer to, to, to do something that people don't expect me to do. 
Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.